Hi everyone. Uh, sorry, my kitchen's a bit of a mess, but uh, I really don't feel like dealing with it right now. And uh, I know I had another video uh, that I was going to do, but uh, things get in the way and, and I'm, I'm really going to... It's, it's, it's still in progress. So for today, well, she's back and she's in the flesh this time. Uh, in the words of one commenter on her debut video, uh, it's as if someone magically bound the soul of Hitler to a Barbie doll. So, yeah, I think you all know who I'm talking about. Uh, her on-camera debut video was, in the words of another commenter, the worst Miss America pageant speech ever. And uh, to that, I would just like to say, well, Miss Arkansas, please tell us all how you would change the world for the better. It is a proposed global initiative for population reduction, which will, in a few decades, lead to a worldwide male population of roughly 1-10% to 10 for the purpose of peace and prosperity around the world. This population reduction is the only logical long-term solution. Our plan is one of pacification and submission, and many of these short-term solutions are already underway in the Western world, so we are confident in our ambition. Now, the creepy thing is, uh, Krista comes across as more charming and self-possessed in conveying her message of how she'd improve humanity than most pageant contestants I've seen. And, and I guess to borrow a line from uh, Herbert Morrison, Oh, the neoteny! I mean, this girl, she's, well, she's like a little fluffy rabbit that shits candied coated chocolates and smells like apple pie. She's just so cute. Anyway. I wasn't really going to do much more than, than just leave a brief comment on her video. Uh, you know, a, a public continuation of one of those private conversations she feels compelled to initiate with me. But while I was doing that and scrolling the other comments, I noticed a nayfault in the thread named Clouds Get in the Way. She said, I am what you would define as a mainstream feminist. What you suggest in the castration of men is nothing short of frightening, and to call it delusional would not approach the full extent of it. Your ideas hurt legitimate feminism like nothing any men's rights group could. I would appeal to you and your supporters to step back and really look at what you propose. Somehow you have lost all sense of the reality of the feminism movement and turned it into something very ugly and hateful. Now, my response to her was... Her ideas are feminism, simply taken to the extreme. Feminism is the identification of the problem. Feminist simply promotes an extreme solution rather than a moderate one. She's the fundamentalist imam reading from the Quran. She's the Westboro Baptist Church reading from the Bible. Clouds Get in the Way's reply was typical. I have been a feminist for a very long time, longer than I care to say. Let me assure you that with many years of information and understanding of everything feminism, this woman in no way represents me or any ideal I hold as a feminist. She is to feminism what Bill O'Reilly is to journalism. Not at all. Now, as an aside, I'm not sure that Clouds Get in the Way is aware that journalism is a vocation and feminism is an ideology. And, and I'm also not sure she's aware that journalist is not the same thing as political commentator. So I'm going to fix her analogy to suit the person X is to ideology Y comparison and say that Krista is to feminism what Bill O'Reilly is to social conservatism. Hmm. Anyhow, I went on to say, just as most Christians would say the Westboro Baptist Church doesn't represent their beliefs, they still hold similar axioms as the truth, don't they? And she followed up with, Christianity is based upon the teachings of the Bible, a book thought to be the word of God. Though a number of interpretations may exist, the Bible is the basis of faith and the unchallenged authority. Feminism has no such thing, no set of rules set down by a higher order. It is purely interpretive, and what is right and just is decided in a more democratic way. As with any group seeking change, there will be extreme factions that do not represent the whole. Now, as one other commenter noted, uh, it, it kind of seems a little bit bizarre that 
uh, this woman could say feminism is interpretive, right? And then at the same time say this woman's views don't represent feminism um, because that, that really just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. However, one thing I did notice about Cloud's objections to Krista's modest proposal was that perfectly in keeping with the priorities of feminists, this particular mainstreamer found the idea of castrating all men and boys or reducing the male population down to 1% coming from a self-identified feminist highly offensive in that it might tarnish the good name of feminism. Why, it's almost as if no feminist had ever proposed such a thing before. And now that one has, for the very first time ever in the entire history of feminism, we must of course examine how this whole advocating castration and male genocide thing might negatively affect the women's movement. Priorities, people. Anyway, keep in mind, I'm not saying that clouds get in the way is an agreement with Krista on the whole castration and male depopulation thing, just like I'm almost positive that most moderate Muslims aren't really that interested in chopping people's heads off for drawing cartoons of Muhammad. And, and I really don't believe this is a case of one genocidal maniac scolding the other for letting the cat out of the bag too soon. But I will go so far as to assert that as feminists, Clouds and Krista are almost certainly going to be in agreement on a few of the fundamental tenets of feminist dogma. You know, like, uh, the patriarchy. Now, in keeping with Cloud's theme of it's open to interpretation, I'm going to provide kind of a moderate interpretation of the patriarchy. You know, one that doesn't involve men intentionally being evil conspiratorial assholes who twirl their mustaches while seated around a conference table inside a volcano, sipping bottled water and plotting how best to oppress and enslave women this week. So here we go. The patriarchy. Society is male-dominated, and male dominance privileges men over women. While some men can sometimes be harmed by this system, the system itself is set up to privilege men and subjugate and exploit women for men's express benefit. In other words, men are in power, and the system operates to benefit and serve men's needs, drives, and interests at the expense of women's needs, drives, and interests. Alright, is that fair enough? Now. I'm pretty sure that most feminists are probably going to buy into this definition or some reasonable facsimile of it. Uh, I know this because I've never really ever heard the concept of female privilege discussed seriously by feminists, uh, other than to just dismiss the whole idea as benevolent sexism. That is, because women are not in power, they can't have real, actual, genuine, and for true female privilege. Women aren't in power, therefore any unfair advantages they have are imposed on women as a class, rather than chosen or generated by them. And likewise, because men are in power, any unfair advantages they have are chosen or generated by them as a class rather than imposed on them, and therefore those advantages are privilege. So just as most feminists define sexism as negative discrimination plus power, they define privilege as positive discrimination plus power. And at this point, I'm going to invite some feminists, if, if they're like taking serious umbrage at uh, my definitions and my interpretations of what all of this bullshit means, uh, go ahead and correct me in the comments. Uh, if anything in, in my definition doesn't fly with you. But when you do, be sure to explain it like I'm five years old so that everyone here can see that you understand exactly what you're talking about. And in addition, uh, any objection based on the idea that kiriarchy is different will be rejected as derailing. Uh, if in your newfangled hokum version of reality, men are still uniformly privileged over women, you can spare us all the bother of reading it by sparing yourself the bother of typing it out. So, to reiterate, Patriarchy means that society is male-dominated and male dominance privileges men over women. While men can sometimes be harmed by the system, the system itself is set up to privilege men and to subjugate women and exploit them for men's express benefit. In other words, men are in power and the system operates to benefit and serve men's needs, drives, and interests at the expense of women's needs, drives, and interests. So now we're going to get into the really interpretive part. Um, from this definition, we can determine a few things. One, 
Men have always wanted the system to operate in this way. Otherwise they, as those with power, would have changed it. Two, because of one above, the system obviously agrees with men's natural inclinations, which three, are to be naturally oppressive, violent, rapey, selfish, objectifying, and aggressive in the service of their own interests and in their disregard for the interests of women. And there you have it, the ideological seeds from which a Hitler Barbie doll has sprouted. So how did we get from patriarchy theory all the way to Krista's genocidal fantasies? I mean, certainly she's not the first feminist woman to propose this. Uh, feminist icons such as Valerie Solanus, who was embraced by her feminist contemporaries, including Robin Morgan, despite all the revisionist history we've heard on the subject. Or Mary Daly, uh, who was considered so crazy by her contemporaries that she was offered tenure at Boston University. Uh, they've both proposed the reduction or extermination of men as solutions to women's problems. Um, and, and the ladies at Radical Hub, they think it's, it's just a, a jolly good idea as well. Uh, it, it's definitely the only way that women can be truly liberated is to get rid of the men. Or genetically re-engineer the men. Now, try as I might, I don't know that I have ever found someone proposing male genocide, real, like reducing or exterminating males on a global scale. I don't think I have ever come across that idea proposed by someone who wasn't a feminist or involved with feminists, or supported by feminists, or beatified by feminists. You know, this whole male genocide thing, uh, it really does seem unique to feminists. Because while genocides have been perpetrated throughout human history, and while men and boys generally do bear the brunt of them in most cases, and while there have certainly been some infamous women in the past who made a hobby of murdering men just because they were men, you know, the actual concrete proposal to kill off all or most of the men is something just relatively new on the human scene. It's only been rearing its ugly head for the last 50 years or so. And uh, oddly enough, that just coincides with feminist theory, second wave feminism, the, the women who wrote all of the theory. And I don't really think that we can discuss uh, why exactly this is the case without examining some of the socio-psychological precursors that precede genocides. Now, the very first one is the sorting of people into categories of us and them. You know, this is something that all humans do. Whites and blacks, Asians and Hispanics, men and women, boys and girls, the young and the elderly, dog lovers and cat lovers. Uh, we do tend to categorize things that's just the way our brains work. So categorization is the first step. And then the next step is othering, right? It requires that the target group be othered. It requires its proponent to decide that we are the us and they are the them. Now, women are certainly capable of seeing themselves and men in this way. A study on auto automatic in-group bias by gender done in 2004 demonstrated that women have a strong psychological mechanism that bolsters automatic own group preference based on gender. In fact, in the experiments, all other things being equal, women sided with women four out of four times. In other words, women have a strong sense of us based on nothing more than sex. In contrast, men sided with women three out of four times, indicating not only a lack of own group preference based on gender, but also a strong bias toward women. So while men probably do have a fairly decent sense of them when it comes to women, they're kind of missing the whole us part when it comes to the concept of us men against them women. In fact, when it comes to the battle of the sexes, men would actually rather side with the them than the us, oddly enough. But this us and them thing really isn't all that's required to engender a genocidal longing in a person or group of people. You need another few key ingredients. Now, I'm going to read from a piece by atheist Paula Kirby called The Sisterhood of the Oppressed. And I'm going to link to that in the low bar. It's an excellent read. It's, I, I recommend it to anybody to give that uh, a quick look over. 
or an in-depth look over. Any kind of look over. Go read it. Let's consider 1930s Germany for a moment. How did the Nazis gain popular support? By exploiting a sense of grievance post-Versailles, by continually telling the German people that they'd been treated abominably, had their noses ground in the dust, been unfairly penalized, that they were the victims of an international Jew-led conspiracy, that they needed to rise from the ashes and gain their revenge and their proper God-ordained place in the world. It was a form of madness that took hold of virtually an entire nation. It seems that it is horribly easy to persuade humans of their victimhood and to create in them a dangerous persecution complex that then justifies any action against their enemy because really it is only a form of self-defense. There are real parallels with what has been going on in the sisterhood over the last year. Change the terminology a little and you have the poor oppressed, victimized, unfairly ignored women being urged to rise up against the evil conspiracy of those men, women haters, sister shamers, and gender traitors who are responsible for all their woes. Now, as an aside, I'm going to say that Paula Kirby wasn't speaking of feminism in the context of the wider culture, but within the microcosm of the atheist community, where it's only recently made serious inroads. In the wider culture, there have been pockets of the sisterhood who've been talking this way for decades and who've gone way beyond the stage of complaining and feeling persecuted and arrived at the stage of indulging discussion of the kinds of final solutions our Miss Genocidal America contestant so prettily and adorably embraces. Now, what I find really interesting is that all of the women that I've personally heard who have discussed this final solution are essentially living like princesses compared to how women lived, say, a thousand years ago. I mean, life is a, is a total cakewalk for a Krista, or a Mary Daly, or even for an ex-prostitute like Valerie Solanus, compared to even the, the privileged women during the height of what feminists would describe as the dark ages of female oppression. But if there's any evidence of some 500-year-old version of the Scum Manifesto written by some anonymous nun and tucked away in a tower somewhere, I'll eat my hat. Well, if I had a hat. And you know, it's not as if traditional societies didn't and don't discuss how harmful and dangerous and predacious men naturally are either. It's not as if women a thousand years ago uh, would have been hearing only nice things about men. There's, there's a great deal of congruence between, say, fundamentalist Muslim rationalizations of the burqa that if a man were to view a woman's flesh or hair, there's no telling what he might do to her, right? And this lovely gem from the pro-feminist atheist Rebecca Watson chum Greg Layden. Men, by and large, have a rape switch. All men are capable of rape. Most men are enculturated in a way that reduces rape, and in some societies it is probably true that most violent rape is carried out by individuals who are reasonably labeled as pathological. In other societies, this is not so true. In post-war societies, such as those described in some of these links, or any society in a state of war, rape becomes routine. The rape switch is flipped to the on position as a matter of course. Now, it seems to me that the only thing that Greg Layden and, and some fundamentalist imam defending the burqa are in disagreement over is the proposed solution. Who is responsible for keeping the rates, rape switch on-off? Okay, and, and the, the traditionalist view is that women are at least in part responsible for doing that, for, for wearing the burqa and keeping themselves safe from the horrible evil male gaze. Uh, feminists seem to assume that the, the person responsible is the man and what he should basically do is just walk around with his eyes on the pavement in front of him or gouge them out altogether. So... Really, I mean, it's only in the solutions that they differ. Traditionalist and feminist views of masculinity and femininity contain most of the same basic assumptions. Uh, men are strong, women are weak, men are brutal, women are gentle, men are cold, women are nurturing, men are predators, women are prey, men are perpetrators, women are victims. There are, of course, some more subtle differences uh, in their views. The traditionalist view is that a woman needs a man like a fish needs water, even if she only needs him to protect her from other men. The feminist view is that a woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle, 
and that the bicycle is a rape and domestic violence machine that has oppressed and subjugated women for millennia and gets more pay for the same work to boot. You know, women have always defined men through the lens of how men affect women. And in the past, that definition, what is man, included a wide variety of things that weren't harmful at all, things that were not just useful and helpful to women, but necessary to their survival. But we've come to a point in our technological and political evolution where we really just don't see things that way anymore. Women have an illusion of independence from men. You know, an illusion that would be shattered if, for a single day, every man in society just refused to participate. But the illusion is there, no matter how irrational it really is, that no woman needs any man. That anything a man can do, a woman can do, and do it better, and it heals. That men are superfluous, unnecessary to women, unnecessary to society, just dead weight. The ways men are good are no longer perceived by women as necessary to them. And in becoming unnecessary, they become invisible or immaterial. The more deeply a woman buys into this illusion, the less she will care about or even notice the positive features of masculinity or the positive traits of males. You know, the ones that still by and large keep the streets safe, the lights on and the water running. Um, and once she ceases to, uh, once she ceases to benefit from those in a meaningful and observable way, they just simply no longer exist. This is, this is what solipsism is. And, and we all have a degree of that. Uh, I think every woman, every man has a degree of defining the world in terms of how does it affect me? How does it benefit me? How does it harm me? So once men are no longer providing observable benefit, right, then, well, a woman is free to concentrate all her attention on the other ways men affect her. You know, the danger and predation and rape and sexual objectification and misogyny and old boys clubs and male privilege and entitlement and male dominance and patriarchy and toxic masculinity and chauvinism and hegemonic masculinity and sexism and the male urge to control and all those myriad things that feminists use to demonstrate to everyone that men are the problem. You know, all the things feminists talk about until any reasonable person would be sick to death of it. At which point, we circle around to our set of assumptions. You know, those initial ones we extracted from our feminist analysis of the patriarchy, how it operates, and why it operates the way it does. Assumptions that will apply whether a given feminist believes the system was intentionally constructed by men, or something that just happened and is perpetuated by men. 1. Men have always wanted the system to operate in this way, otherwise they, as those with power, would have changed it. 2. Because of 1 above, the system obviously agrees with men's natural inclinations, which 3. Are to be naturally oppressive, violent, rapey, selfish, objectifying, and aggressive in the service of their own interests, and in their disregard for the interests of women. And the lovely, lovely thing about this set of assumptions, and pretty much every feminist set of assumptions, is that none of it is women's responsibility. Men were in power, men are in power, women have no power over how society worked in the past and how it works now. See, this is the wonderful thing. This is the way of taking any kind of responsibility, accountability, and blame for how the system operates and just chucking it as far away from women as you possibly can. It wasn't women's fault. They were just slaves, you see. That's how it works. I mean, they don't even have female privilege. They have benevolent sexism that's Im imposed on them. That's how not at fault they are. Society was never a complex interaction of male nature and female nature coexisting within different environments and generating different cultural norms based on the needs and benefits and, and requirements of both sexes. No, no, it was never that. It was just men wanting things the way they wanted them and doing them that way for their own benefit. Now, Krista is a woman, and as a woman, she's oppressed by the patriarchy. 
And while the patriarchy may not technically be 100% synonymous with men, it is a system of male dominance that is perpetuated by men alone, because men are in power, and only those with power have any real wherewithal to change the system. A slew of biased statistics and misinformation used as agitprop by feminist groups, everything from faulty domestic violence and rape numbers to the statistical bunkum of the pay gap, only confirm to her that she's absolutely correct in identifying herself as a victim or a potential victim of the system. A system that she is helpless to change or work around. Those same statistics tell her that, compared to women, men are brutal and uncaring monsters, something less than human, or at the very least, less human than women. Because men and men alone perpetuate the system, this system that victimizes her exists because it is obviously an intrinsic aspect of male nature to want society to operate in ways that oppress women. And how do you solve that kind of problem without eliminating the perceived source of that problem? BAM! Time for a genocide. Now, the fact that her views are based almost entirely on lies, propaganda, one-sided and revisionist versions of history, faulty data, the projection of female psychology, most notably the own group gender preferencing, onto men, and solipsism may be immaterial to the question of whether Krista represents all feminists. But it's essential to the question of whether or not feminism is responsible for creating her. Because feminism itself is based almost entirely on the exact same lies, propaganda, one-sided and revisionist versions of history, faulty data, the projection of female psychology onto men, and solipsism that magically bound the soul of Hitler to a Barbie doll. You know, feminism, you made this monster, you've made others like her, you don't get to disavow any of them. I'm sorry, but you don't. Anyhow, that is, uh, is all I have to say about uh, how I think clouds get in the way is basically full of shit uh, that I don't care how far feminism tries to distance itself from people like this, from the Mary Daly's and the Valerie Solanus's and the Krista's and the Rad Fem Hub, right? All of it came from the same place. All of their attitudes and all of their plans and all of their beliefs and everything came from feminist scripture. All of it came from patriarchy theory. And I'm sorry, but because I know that patriarchy theory is a load of fucking hogwash, I feel perfectly entitled to blame feminism for generating all that hogwash. I really do. And you know, you can just see how their little minds work as far as someone wants to hold us accountable for something bad? Run! Run the other way! Disavow! Disavow! Ugh. I, I, I don't know whether I can even freaking think more about this right now. Certainly I'm done talking about it for a while. But there you go. Feminism this is your shit. Own it. Talk to you guys later.